DevOps pioneer. Coming to your screens, leads the DevOps and SRE practice at Quality Consulting Unit within Infosys. He has been instrumental in setting up DevOps COing for Greenfield Digital Setups as well as banks. He's a regular speaker at a number of coveted forums on DevOps and SRE across the globe, the latest being DevOps Enterprise Summit Europe Edition. On his talk on SRE Nitty at scale, he will be covering one such success story of a client journey on how SRE is moving to a scale. Without much further ado, let's hear it loud and clear for Mr. Adarsh Mehrotra. I'm Adarsh, 17 years of experience in the IT industry and working as IPCon Industry Principal Consultant with Infosys. And today I want to share uh, an industry experience of SRE journey at a large enterprise. And uh, I promise that the next 30 minutes, they may not be watershed moments for you, but I'm sure it will infuse a lot of new ways of thinking and add to your SRE intellectual capital. Moving on. So what are we going to cover today? We are going to cover the client context and the key challenges. We are going to cover the as a state view, so current architecture and the tooling and the platform that we had. And then we start delving into the solution elements. So we start off with a resiliency framework that I will let you know, which serves as our benchmark. Uh, we talk about certain process areas where we improvised on the operating model. Then, of course, the most tangible part, which is tooling. So we cover it via observability, telemetry, and chaos engineering. And as part of the overall journey, we realized that uh, no matter how good we've set up our processes or how best of the breed tools have been used, but the people part is probably the most important. So the mindset change and how we've taken people along the journey will be covered as part of the people capability uplift. And then, of course, the key outcomes, because, you know, when there's so much of positive work happening, then there has to be a positive outcome. With that, I'll move on. So I think the first way to, to, to talk about or describe is what actually is SRE or site reliability engineering. And I'm sure a lot of us know from a background perspective, this term was coined by Google in 2003. And Google said that if we have to solve or crack the problems in production, why don't we use a software engineering mindset? And so if you see today, 40 to 90% of the systems that we have, you know, the cost of these systems are incurred after their birth. And hence, uh, factors like your performance, your scalability, your reliability at scale, some of these issues, this is what the organizations are looking at, and hence the need for SRE. Now, there are two kinds of complexities that you find uh, with the systems. We call as the, the first com uh, complexity, we will call as the incidental or the essential uh, complexity, which means that it is bound to be there in the systems, given the kind of landscape that we may have. And the second one is the accidental complexity in the system. This is the one that the SRE solved, the accidental complexity in the system. So now that we have established the what SRE actually means, that is where we move ahead. And now I will do a bit of a deep dive into the case study that we have. So now this client that I'm talking about is an Australian-based telco, and their presence is in 20 countries. They are into the areas of uh, you know IPTV, internet, um, then, of course, the, the voice segment as well. And uh, we've been there end-to-end -end IT partners uh, for close to 20 years plus. And uh, the very important point that I want to highlight is that there was already a very strong DevOps foundation. So, um, you know, almost close to 18 to 20 months of the journey uh, was already undertaken. And I was part of the DevOps COE, where we had already laid down a lot of foundation on the CICD practices, the quality and security embedded within your pipelines, uh, the right kind of gating mechanism, um, and likewise. So we had 300 plus uh, feature teams that were fully uh, working in the Agile and, and DevSecOps model. And it was a value stream-led delivery, which means that the feature teams were capable of pulling the features all by themselves to the backlog and deploy to production. Now, this was also helped because a lot of infrastructure uh, as service was used on top of AWS and Pivotal Cloud Foundry, and there was an already strong test automation suite running. Now, with that, when the B2C program was about to get launched some 10 to 11 months before the program, that is where we started looking at certain challenges. And, you know, some of these challenges that I've highlighted on the slide were, you know, the first and the biggest challenge. A lot of these services or application owners were looking for resiliency only in their individual areas. They were not looking at the larger picture or they were not looking at a customer journey. And we need resiliency for that end-to-end -end customer journey. 
So that focus was missing. That was a challenge number one. The challenge number two was that the resiliency aspects were getting sacrificed because of more and more business features were supposed to be pushed in. So for example, you know, a lot of times, even though you may set an error budget adherence, but the teams would not comply with it, uh, the business would, would come back and overrule and things like that. So that is something that was a big challenge for us. So we should probably be having looking at the business features, but at the same time, managing the resiliency equally well. Then while there were a lot of good monitoring systems in place, but the standards that we want to set in terms of, um, you know, the alarms, the monitors, I think there was a fair bit of low maturity there again, uh, because in a lot of times we would get false alarms and things like that. There was also a larger issue around the ownership and whom do we liaise and how do we close the issues. So for example, in your system integration testing environment, you may encounter an issue that, uh, let's take a typical telco case and this is a live example. So we had, for example, an explore and buy journey that we have. And in the journey as an end user, you will go and let's say select a product and then you will add a product to a card and finally it gets, uh, it shows you an order summary page. Now this page would take a long time to load. And so who has the ownership of fixing it? Is it a problem in the networks so that you reach out to the network team and then look at the CDN issues and try and sort it out? Or is it a problem at a design level with your feature teams because they've not designed it fairly well? Or is it a problem with the product because you know we were using Salesforce velocity as a combination and uh, you know maybe the entire JSON was getting thrown back instead of whatever you want to serialize and send. So again, a vendor involvement. So who takes the ownership and tries and solves it. That was a key challenge. So as you can see, uh, if I want to summarize these challenges into four parts, you know, uh, what you see on your right side, resiliency, issues across resiliency, issues across the availability for these systems, the scalability for the systems, and the overall efficiency. And that is, these are the key imperatives or these are the key objectives for SRE as well. And hence, the need of the hour was to introduce SRE. All right, so now it is said that the stronger the why, then the easier the how becomes. And hence the solution elements, are, which are the core part of the journey. Let's take a look at what were the solutions that we undertook to crack or solve these problems. So like I said, you know, we were already around 18 to 20 months in our journey on DevOps. Uh, in fact, uh, interestingly, you know, the, as part of the DevOps COE, we also won the DevOps Communication Awards, the industry awards given at London in the communication sector. So there was a very, very strong foundation of DevOps already set. And the same DevOps team graduated themselves to SRE. It helped in a lot of ways because over a period of close to two years, we already had a lot of proximity with the systems, with the components, with a lot of teams like your network teams or your feature teams, your support teams, enterprise security, and a lot of vendors. So in a way, the components, the interaction between the components, the underlying layers, and some of these softer aspects of liaising with different groups actually came very handy for us. Then what is the solution that we created? So like I said, some of the key solution elements, one, an operating model change. So for example, what are the new roles and responsibilities? Where does the SRE sit? Where do they operate? Who do they liaise with? So the entire SRE ways of working along with a strong undercurrent of a change management, which is required, you know, that part was set first. Then we also looked at the journeys. We also looked at the components and the systems and made sure that we had the right kind of SLOs and SLIs defined. Then the next step was to actually baseline ourselves on where we stand. And that is where a resiliency model, which measures the maturity on SRE, that helped us. Then finally, we ran the pilot with few prioritized journeys, created some lighthouse projects. And once they were in good shape, that is where we scale the entire model. And of course, last but not the least, the continuous improvement part, because no matter how good you get, you can always get better. So I'll move on. Now, like I said, and a very important part for us uh, as an SRE was to understand the overall architecture, the kind of systems that sit through the underlying components, uh, the interactions between the systems and likewise. So as you can look through the diagram, you know, there are various uh, areas that I want to elucidate. So let's take a look at some of the complexity in the architecture. You can see a lot of cost products there. You have a Salesforce, you have a Velocity, you have a service now, you have an Adobe Experience Manager and likewise. Now what happens is that if you have so many cost products thrown in, then the diagnosis on where and what went wrong actually becomes very difficult. You'll also see a lot of third party integrations because and this is especially around the charging and the payments area and there again you know a lot of factors come into play uh, when you talk about third party integrations things like tokenization encryption vendor risk management and likewise so now given the diversity of the landscape that i've shown you how do we know what good looks like for us and in that case we have to first measure where we stand and that is where we needed a reference model what i call as the 
SRE maturity model. So I'll move on and I'll show you what our SRE maturity model or our SRE assessment framework looks like. So as you can see, we targeted the journeys rather than the individual systems. So we said that let's take a look at a customer journey and whatever underlying that customer journey and this would comprise of you know your applications of services it will have infrastructure and network elements it will have data elements it will have you know cyber resiliency aspects devsecops and third party systems so as you can see that a lot of these dimensions get covered and as you start scrolling from the left to right and read this slide you will find that not only the technical aspects of right the way all the way from monitoring to toilet enabling deployment and all of that was covered but also the aspects around the people and the governance um so for example you know factors like what are the kind of skill set for the people when you talk about governance for example where do we have this dedicated sre team sitting um or how's been the team collaboration some of the softer aspects were also covered as part of the overall maturity assessment framework now what i want to do is i want to do a double click uh, especially on the technical capabilities because Uh, you know those are the, probably the most tangible parts and i want to show you a glimpse of the overall model that we have now as you can see on my screen this is the sre framework from a technical perspective and the areas that we cover uh, right from monitoring alarming and logging all the way till security access and deployment and each one of them is double clicked with a number of yeah, sub areas under them it's important to realize though that how you define them and how you explain it back to the organization becomes very important people were for example getting confused between you're talking about monitoring and at the same time you mention observability are they one in the same things so that is where a lot of explanation both in terms of the right kind of communication as well as you know on pages like confluence was set up So for example we would go back and tell them that if I am talking about observability I am actually looking at why such a problem happened whereas if I was talking about monitoring it will tell me when a problem happened so essentially monitoring is kind of a subset within observability people will try and understand what are the differences we are trying to say when we are saying availability versus reliability your system may be available 99.9% time but uh, you know it may still not be reliable it may still be crashing quite often so all of this definitions and what we mean by each one of them was made very clear to the teams and then they underwent the assessment on all of these areas and that is where we benchmarked and baselined where the team stand in terms of the gaps that they had so complete gaps no so no gaps and partial gaps that is how kind of scale of 1 to 3 you can say now once we had assessed the teams alongside we also wanted to ensure that the operating model was set up right and that is where it is very important to understand where are the liaising points that we have what kind of roles and responsibilities we will bring with this sre layer so for example in our case we injected the sre somewhere between an l1 and an l2 and we called them l1.5 this is because we didn't want to create kind of ripples or jitters within our operations world so we said that you know this sre layer what they are going to do is they will have two kind of backlogs one they will drive a centralized backlog where they will look at let us say horizontal practices like setting up an entire deployment monitoring solution or they would set up business monitoring solutions and likewise and at the same time they will work in proximity with the feature teams and make sure that the characteristics that we talked about you know availability scalability performance all that were up to the mark so i'll give you a few examples so for example you may be a feature team and you want to do a blue green deployment on aws but you don't know how So that is where you know an SRE will be injected to your team and they help you in drawing up the blue green architecture and making sure that you follow the blue green so that is where the SRE will contribute not only towards a centralized backlog but they would also work in proximity with the feature teams so what happened is that we set up this whole pod which had the SRE architects and the SRE engineers what you see on screen and they started liaising with with various teams like your network team your operations team uh, your L1 layer and likewise in driving the reliability across the systems but you know the, how did we scale this model that is very important to, to understand so when we ran the pilots we created the lighthouse projects so when i say lighthouse projects it means that these projects became flawless over a period of time so when you do an assessment you find out certain issues or vulnerabilities with what they had the sre team worked very closely with them and made sure you know all the boxes were ticked they were all green and then they served as a projects that other teams could emulate now we could not associate let's say one sre engineer with one team two team three teams because at the end of the day we had 300 plus teams so what we did is we said that now that in all of your areas in so typically if you divide 
you know, a telco customer into a customer journey. We created lighthouse projects, let's say, for a prospect to order, then an order to activate journey, uh, then a usage to cash journey, and then your request to resolve. These are kind of the four broad journeys that you see. And then we had created a centralized epics, which were like your NFRs, and the teams would use those NFRs. They would embed it in their day-to-day working. And then we started serving as auditors rather than working with every single feature team. So that way the model got scaled up and in close to less than seven to eight months of time frame, we could see a lot of positive results across the board, across all of these four journeys, like I mentioned. So that is how the operating model changed and uh, you know the, the kind of tweaks that we had made uh, in terms of the people reaching out to the higher maturity levels that worked very well. Now, I talked about a centralized backlog for the SRE team, and I wanted to bring a bit of a showcase element with some of these slide where this is the kind of work that we've done. So, for example, from a deployment perspective, we created a centralized deployment dashboard, which covered things like who made a deployment, in what environment, how long did it take, did it work or did it pass or did it fail. So if you look, for example, any standard uh, metrics today, and in fact, in the DevOps world, we follow DORA metrics, right? So one of the important metrics there is deployment cadence and success. So this is exactly what this does. And a couple of salient uh, features I wanted to highlight. So we had two different monitoring systems. We utilized Splunk for monitoring our legacy world. And for our modern world or for our digital world, we had introduced New Relic. So all the data from New Relic would actually move to Splunk because uh, the other way did not work very well for us. And hence, on one central place, a single source of truth worked for all the stakeholders. And you could come here on this dashboard, take a look. And then this helped in solving a lot of issues around deployment. Otherwise, you know, there was a lot of manual effort in solving our deployment issues. So as you can see, a lot of benefits with a centralized dashboard like this. Your deployment issues come down with a lot of effort saving around the deployment. In similar way, you know, we set up an automated database monitoring solution as well. And again, uh, you know, a number of good metrics from a database perspective. Now, it is also important to realize that the metrics that uh, we propose, you know, it should not be overwhelming, both for the teams as well as for the people who consume it. So we have to be very selective in terms of what good metric look like. So for example, in case of databases, we started showing what are your blocking logs or where are the deadlocks and the kind of data base space availability and, and those. So, you know, poor metric will actually have a huge inertia and it'll have a high switching cost. So we'll have to keep that in mind. And that was one of the major goals for us to make sure that we bring in the apt metrics within our dashboards. The third area that I wanted to highlight is a very, very potent dashboard that we prepared for from a business perspective. So this captures your business journeys end to end and it shows you all the critical business functionality end to end. And it will tell you, for example, what are the SLOs and have you followed those SLOs or not? So typically when you go, so from a business perspective, you know, some of the important metrics in a telco world, for example, what has been your average order count or for example, how long did your overall order journey take? So your order completion time and likewise. So some of these important areas that we created for business and they've been of massive help to see where the things are, where they are failing, where the orders are falling off and likewise. So here is a very crisp view from some of these customer journeys that we talk about. So how many customers have placed an order and how many of those orders are compliant, where all things have passed and where all things have failed. And once you double click on this from this business scenario perspective, it shows you where in actual systems the problems emanate. So those are some of the centralized dashboards that we prepared for the team because, you know, what you measure, that helps us in growing a lot, uh, in doing a lot better. Now that we had looked at some of these central dashboards and bringing visibility because we, you know, I just said that attention is actually the currency. We started looking at the resiliency of our infrastructure and uh, chaos engineering is one such tool which helps in actually making sure that you don't reach to an outage stage because outages are extremely costly. So we cannot afford an outage. So how do you preempt uh, some of these situations? And that is where we started testing our infrastructure. Now, it is important to note that, at least in this case, the business did not have a lot of confidence where we could run chaos experiments in production. But we had a pre-production box, which was fairly close to production, and we mimicked whatever was in production in pre-production. So some of these tests that I'm going to talk about have actually run in a pre-production box rather than a production box. So the steps are fairly simple when you perform a chaos experiment. So what you do is that you plan for an experiment, then you create a blast radius, which means that this is the area that you want to inject the chaos, and 
and then you either squash it, you know, or if you find an issue, you go ahead and fix it and then you increase your blast radius. So those are the kind of very simple steps that I would say from a chaos perspective and we utilize this tool called chaos blade. So some of the things that we tried, for example, if I turn an EC2 instance off, how much time does it take for us to to get back? And in that failover time, am I losing orders or not? So in our case, for example, it was fairly robust. It hardly took around 28 seconds for it to come back. And similarly, we would turn our DynamoDB database off and see how quickly can we restore that and likewise. So a number of such Kiosk experiments were actually very helpful in making sure that the infrastructure was very robust. So now that we have talked a lot about the process aspects with the operating model, we have talked about the tooling aspects with some of the dashboards that I showed you and the kiosk engineering part. Like I said, it's very equally important that we carry the people along the journey and that is where change management becomes extremely important. So for example, what is the right kind of messaging that we are giving when we are introducing something like an SRE? I hope it is not perceived as a threat, let's say, for our operations guys and likewise. Similarly, the right kind of communication channels. So you have to spread the good word around by having organizing some brown bag lunches or making sure that you have a lot of meetups and town halls. You also are introducing the new roles and responsibilities within the systems. So making sure that it aligns with your overall organization model. We have to also ensure that we build in a lot of competency planning and bring in a lot of training aspects because at the end of the day, we want an upskilled and reskilled workforce. So a lot of these aspects were part of the overall organization change management drive. And we ensured that we had a change manager actually who was responsible for stitching all of this together and making sure that it was a very smooth journey when it came to the change management side of the things for SRE. So like I mentioned, a very important part in the people journey is how you manage your people. And uh, so there were a lot of people within the operations group who wanted to be upskilled and reskilled on SRE. And hence, we created the enablement path or the training plan for them. So there were a couple of roles that we brought in uh, an SRE, which is a site reliability engineer, a site reliability architect, and likewise. And there were a number of steps that you could take and graduate yourself to that SRE or to the site reliability architect. And then you start helping the teams along the journey. So now what happened is with introduction of things like this, it gave a great opportunity for operations guys to be part of the overall journey and they didn't feel kind of left behind. Now, what happens in such cases is that you also have to sustain the momentum because a lot of times, you know, you will see that the, the momentum is a lot when you start, but it kind of wanes off during the course, say after four to five months. And that is where we brought in gamification here. So for example, we started creating leaderboards for people who would complete the courses on time or who would be, you know, very good score, very high marks uh, during this entire journey and likewise. And then if they were consistent performers over a period of time, they were sitting high on the leaderboard. The top three people or top five people getting rewarded with an Amazon voucher and likewise. So gamification as a technique helped us in making sure that we continued the momentum. All right. So we have reached probably towards the end of our conversation and, uh, you know, no conversation ends without the right kind of outcomes. So again, this entire journey of close to a year plus uh, resulted in a lot of good outcomes, positive outcomes for us. And the biggest outcome from a business perspective was the overall order journey. Actually, um, the, the, the time taken for an overall order journey actually came down. So a number of improvement areas, whether it was uh, fine tuning from a login as on a usage perspective, or from an order status perspective, or from a payments perspective, we knocked out a lot of time for that entire order completion. And the performance improvement was, was a big, big thing from a business perspective. So performance improvement, one of the big uh, things that we achieved. The second one was on the infrastructure side of things. So we had used a decentralized approach, which means that we give a lot of responsibility to the feature teams to maintain and manage by themselves, which also meant that a lot of environment that they managed on AWS was on their own. So, you know, uh, teams that were fairly not mature, uh, possibly would utilize, let's like, say, a T3 large instance instead of a T2 micro. And some of that would result in what I call as a cloud sprawl. So, uh, you know, you have left and right the infrastructure that you've set up, which is not good for usage or not most optimal. And that is where the infrastructure optimization was a big, big thing for us. Uh, because at the same time, while we wanted the teams to control and manage, we didn't want them to go haywire. So a lot of fine tuning and improvements we did on the AWS infrastructure to make sure that it was sustainable for us. And then, of course, I talked a lot about some of these accelerators or some of these dashboards that you saw. So, you know, visibility, that is what we were all after. And we made sure that the visibility was there. So I hope that we are kind of coming in towards the end of the conversation. And I hope 
this was helpful because what happens is that when you start hearing out on such experiences, there are certain challenges which you can correlate. And then um, it helps us in moving a lot faster and expediting our journey. So with that, I come to the end of the conversation. Thanks a lot for your time. And it's time for any question Q&A and we can move forward with that. Thank you.